Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Coin Journal podcast. It is the 21st of June, the summer solstice today. Hope you're enjoying it. My name is Joe, your host, uh, as always, joined by Dan Ashmore, and we have a very special guest today, uh, Slava Rubin. Uh, Slavin is the creator of Vincent, which is the world's largest alternative asset invent- investment search engine. Bit of a mouthful there. Um, Vincent have just launched Vault, which is their professionally managed investment product. Uh, Slava, was that a fairly good summation of what Vault is? I think that was a great summary. Yeah, we've had 600,000 investors use our search engine. The number one request is, hey, can you manage this for me? It's too much time, effort, money or access to figure this out. I want somebody else to do it. And we created Vault for exactly that. The first of its kind fund with one investment, you get diversified exposure across all of Vaults. Excellent. And what, what kind of things are we talking about when you talk about those, those alternative assets? Yeah, so you get everything from real estate to pre-IPO venture, crypto, art, which includes NFTs, collectibles like sports cards, debt, um, and, and those are some of the examples. Great. So obviously, you know, our kind of area of interest is particularly on the, on the crypto side of things. Um, what kind of drew you in from, in terms of having a, a more traditional alternative asset background? What drew you in about crypto and NFTs in the first place? Well, for us, um, it's really about getting the diversified exposure to the people. Institutions or family offices or the ultra high net worth have known for a long time, you need to really have your money make money for you. And often that's outside of just the public equities or bonds or cash. And they've done a great job of investing into alternatives. But for the 99%, it's been too challenging and too much complexity. So we created this fund. And one of the things that people like that they get exposure into is crypto because again they're either nervous they do it themselves they don't want to have to remember their keys they don't want to have fraud happen or lose uh their coins uh, but they also don't want to go all in on crypto into some major fund investment just for crypto and they like having that spread across all of these assets and we thought crypto is a great alternative asset there's a lot of um you know dynamicism to it you know we have a number of different investments into crypto whether it's Bitcoin and ETH, the layer ones or other types of investments. And we really go with a blue chip diversified exposure. That's great. I'm going to hand off to Dan now for a bit more intelligent questioning. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Um, yeah, it's interesting. So am I right in saying that it's like you invest into Vault as a whole? You can't pick like individual alternative assets, like a fund. That's exactly correct. So you put in an investment, 25K or more, um, and then we deploy it over six months. You don't get to choose what you want to be in or out of. You just invest into the pool. And then it's a three-year liquidity product where we expect to return money uh, at three years with potential extensions of a plus one, plus one, meaning maximum five years. Um, But we do share all of our investments and decisions along the way. So you get to ride shotgun with us via our app. We share all of our investments, all of our deal memos as to why we made those investments. And all of that is very transparent via our app as well. Okay. And it's all actively managed, is it? Correct. So it's all managed uh, by us. We either invest into whole assets. For example, like we bought a premier Babe Ruth card, one of the best in existence, a 1933 Gaudi PSA 8. Um, We've also invested into fractional ownership. So we have shares of like SpaceX or Flexport, or we invest into funds, for example, an NFT fund called 6529, which is an anonymously led fund by some of the best crypto investors out there. So we do all three options and we invested over a six month period and then we go long uh, until we exit. And do you find like investors come to you? So I guess the traditional reason that people would delve into alternative assets would be either for the information asymmetry and to outperform or for diversification? Is it a combination of both or what, 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 what's the main demand here? That's exactly right. Uh, people have done a good job of taking their money out of their uh, underneath their mattresses, you know, and they're saving. They've done a good job of preparing for retirement. They've done a good job of creating the rainy day account. Uh, what they haven't been doing a great job of until recently is diversifying into alts. That's really a very new thing in the last 15 or 20 years. And a lot of people are trying to figure out how to get that exposure, whether it's 3% of their net worth, up to 20% of their net worth, et cetera, et cetera. And they find it too intimidating to have to pick the assets, to do all the diligence, 
to pick the managers, to have the minimums, to diversify across all these assets, to diversify across these asset classes. So what we're offering them is the one-stop shop to be able to do that. That's exactly right. And, yeah, what they're and for, what they're looking for is the uncorrelated assets, you know, so it doesn't have to go directly in line with the market. For example, some of our sports cards are going up right now and getting marked up while you know, public markets are getting hammered, while crypto markets are getting hammered. You just saw some collectibles in the last few months, you know, being sold for $195 million for a painting, $135 million approximately for a car. You know, collectibles and the most rare, rare, rare assets are still very much in demand because things that are rare will always be rare. Um, so having some of that uncorrelated, whether it's real estate, whether it's farmland is very valuable. And like you say, the information asymmetry is where they're trying to learn about this as well by writing shotgun along with us in the app and in the, all of our communications. If I could just jump in really quick with a question here, the guys who are making these picks for all these different assets, what's their background? How do they develop that kind of information asymmetry? Yeah, so we have uh, three partners that are running it, including myself. Uh, we have years of experience. So I run a venture fund separately. So an early stage fund, serial entrepreneur. We've been investing in crypto for years. One of the partners has run his own uh, crypto fund and also been a VC. We've been investing in pre-IPO uh, for well over a decade into collectibles for decades. Um, and then also on our team, we have great analysts uh, and principals on the team that help do all the diligence. So we combine both our own knowledge as well as our network of advisors to be able to, as you say, find the information asymmetry and create these investments. And across all of those different stuff, collectibles, private equity, crypto, NFTs, do you have like a favorite pick over the years that you've, that you've found? Well, Vault started uh, last year. So the Vault Fund is fairly new. I must admit, my favorite thing is collectibles. I feel like sports cards, comic books, uh, all like we have Batman number one in the fund. We, like I mentioned, we have a very rare Babe Ruth. We have Serena Williams rookie card. We have Lou Gehrig. You know, we have Mickey Mantle, Will Chamberlain. We have Michael Jordan's original sneakers, meaning his actual sneakers that he was given. One of the like sub 20 pairs, the original Jordans that are dual signature by him. Um, little known fact, but he has two different size feet. So if somebody ever sells you Jordans, that Jordan wore and they're the same size, that's fraud. Uh, one's, a third <laughs> size, one's a size 13 and the other is a size 13 and a half. Um, but yeah, I mean, I love crypto as well. Um, and obviously crypto is having, you know, a little bit of a winter right now to say the least, but we also think it's a great entry point at this 18, 20,000 plus minus, um, you know, three, again, we're a three year fund. So we're looking to be able to get into these attractive prices because three to five years out, uh, we hope everybody will be saying, man, I wish I got into it back then. And that's how we're approaching it. And so in the kind of, sorry, go ahead, Dan, go ahead. I was just going to say, so you are like scaling into crypto now, you say like 18 to 20K is a good entry point. Yeah, I mean, no one can predict exactly the future. Um, I think there's definitely been some support around 18. There was some support there on the way up and on the way down. Uh, obviously, once we broke that 29 or whatever, you know, there was definitely a chance it was going to plummet. So I was waiting mm -hmm. to see it come down to that. If we break 18, like really break it, not just for a minute or an hour, but, you know, start going back down to 10. I think we have some significant issues uh, given the cost, of, you know, to mine Bitcoin and all that. So I think it'll be sticking around 18 for a while. But again, we're long um, and we this is. Like people say, if you like Bitcoin at 69, you probably should like it more at 18. If you don't like it, you don't like it, right? Uh, same thing for all these other assets. A lot of them are on sale. If you didn't like them, they were bad anyway. And if you like them, they're on sale. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm curious how, so you mentioned there like earlier collectibles, a few collectibles have actually gone up, which is crazy to think any assets gone up recently. But like, how, how would you say go about doing due diligence on just, just to use your example, the pair of Jordans, like to think, oh, this is a good price here. Like, do you, would you reach out and get an expert in that specific field of sneakers or like, presumably you can't have knowledge about all these esoteric alternative assets, right? Well, you can't have more knowledge than others. Maybe not have all the knowledge, but yeah, my team has a lot of knowledge. I've been investing in the collectibles for 30 years. Uh, collectively, the team has decades of experience. Yeah, we work with our advisors. We navigate across all the different auctions, the shows, private sales. We look for different opportunities to get a better deal. And 
you know, part of this market correction has had some crypto money go on the sidelines. Definitely in the bull market, some of the crypto money was diversifying into these collectibles. I think some of that money has dried up, which has created more value in the collectibles uh, in terms of getting a better price. And yeah, I mean, I would say a number of our collectible items have already been marked up. In total, Vault 1 uh, since inception is beating the S&P uh, as well as beating BTC in terms of its performance. Uh, we're still talking about um, you know a slight negative, but not nearly to what we're talking about in terms of the crypto markets or even S and P, which is down about approximately twenty percent. But you know, some of our segments are actually up, like collectibles. If we were quote unquote just a collectibles fund, we'd be up. Um, and I actually believe it will stay up because again, when you get these super rare assets, uh, people just want those assets. To be clear, I'm not telling you a Michael Jordan rookie card is a good idea because there's a lot of them. So those are going down. But when you get things that there's only 20 of, you know, those things are just people have demand. So when you say like, yeah, your collectibles have gone up, saying we're talking about these cards that are there's only 20 of them. Like, how do you mark them to market? And like, because there's obviously huge illiquidity here. Like, are you just looking maybe at whatever similar assets are going at that price or like, yeah, what's your market market mechanism? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, BTC mark to market is very easy, right? You just have lots yeah. of places where BTC is trading. Um, it, it absolutely is the way you say it all depends on the liquidity of that exact card. Um, so the number of times that a PSA 8 Gaudi Babe Ruth rookie card number 181 trades is very rare. So, you know, we bought that card for hundreds of thousands of dollars and it's going to be hard to market every week. Um, um, now, on the flip side, we've got an Ovechkin rookie card just under a year ago, and you know it's already traded directionally up. So we were able to market because there's 99 of them in existence. So some of them have actually traded in the last year, not a lot of them. Um, similarly, there's you know Will Chamberlain just actually yesterday, I think it was uh, the most expensive Will Chamberlain PSA nine ever sold. I think it was something like six hundred fifty thousand dollars. So, um, you know, just to get you real life into our process, we got a, a piece of a PSA nine a while back for three hundred twenty thousand dollars. So three hundred twenty is obviously less than six hundred fifty. So somebody who doesn't know the details would be like, great, our card is now worth six hundred fifty. But it's not that simple because all PSA nines, even though they are officially equal PSA nines, they're not equal because one is more beautiful than the other. And the one that just got, you know, the highest valuation of all time is considered a top five percentile of the nines. So then you have to compare where do we think our nine is at? And, you know, we try to discount all of that. So, you know, we actually work with professionals and look to market, but you're getting right into the mix of how that happens. It's very interesting, but, you know, we try to be as accurate as possible using exact same cards. Uh, sometimes people want to get into uh, marking next to cards that are similar, but that could be a very tricky, slippery slope because it could be a totally different asset. Instead of there only being 12 of them, there could be 100 of them. So the value would be very different and the demand could be very different. So that was real life just showing you how uh, those marks happen. So, yeah, that Will Chamberlain, we got pretty excited when, you know, more than double what we paid for for a similar card, meaning a PSA 9, not just the same type of card, a 1961 FLIR. But literally a PSA nine. But I will admit, okay. the new one is definitely more beautiful than ours. But ours is still great. Oh, I, I think you're testing me and Joe's uh, European sports background here. But <laughs> I, uh, is is it all? Yeah, are there any European? Uh, you got any like soccer cards or anything, or is it just pure oh, American okay. sports? Yeah, let me let me let me drop it on you big here. Ready? We got Pele's rookie card. Pele's That's so wild. Okay, we're we're big football fans here. What is our soccer fans? Yeah, have, have you heard of Have you heard of Pele? No, we, oh, of course you've heard of Pele. But how is a rookie? Like, what, what is a Pele rookie card? So um, it's a great question. There's 1958 is considered his uh, true rookie card, and there's only about a hundred that have ever been graded in existence. Less than a hundred. So we have one of them. Um, it's pretty epic. That's another card. So Pele rookie cards of all grades, meaning there's only like a hundred of them in existence have all been going up month over month. Uh, anytime you see a new transaction, which is not every month, obviously, because there's only 100. Um, but they just broke the record a few months ago for selling a PSA 9, um, I think for like 1.3 million or something like that. We don't have a PSA 9, we have a lower grade, but all the Pele's at every grade are increasing in value. Uh, similarly, you might've heard of a guy named Messi. So we have a Messi rookie card. 
Um, and we got great value. It's the highest graded VGS um, that's out there, meaning the highest 9.5 that's out there. Uh, we're getting into a lot of subtlety here, but BGS, which is another grading agency, um, back to grading services, they actually do four subgrades. Not all grading uh, agencies do subgrades, but they do four subgrades. And the card that we got has the, the best combination of four subgrades for that grade. We're getting into a lot of details here, which just shows you our knowledge about collectibles. But yeah, we know a thing or two about soccer as well. We got great value there. Um, I've been to every World Cup since 94, so I'm a fan. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, but I presume like uh, the Amer like say a Michael Jordan kind of garners more like his pop culture impact and just the American collectible interest would be higher than Europeans. Like Michael Jordan would be more, worth more than Messi in general, right? As a simple concept, yes, but yeah. it all depends on the rarity of the card. So the problem with Michael Jordan's rookie card, which is usually considered the 86, 87 Fleer rookie card, is there's just a lot of them. So the quantity okay. is very high because back in the 80s, which is called the junk wax era, which is really when they overprinted cards and there was just too much supply. So that is why when you, if you want to have the most expensive Michael Jordan assets possible, it's usually not a card. There actually is a very rare card from the 90s um, that came out, but really it's usually actually memorabilia like his jerseys, his sneakers. If you have Michael Jordan's game worn sneakers, that stuff is sick. Our sneakers are not game worn. They are Michael Jordan sneakers signed by him, made for him, uh, but he did not wear them. Okay, so they printed a load of cards as the Jerome Powell of the the uh, exactly. collectibles world. Exactly. So that That's... happened in the eighties uh, because in the seventies people started getting into cards again, and that lasted until the mid nineties, and then they really clamped down in the mid nineties. So they started creating all basically limitations um, through this exclusive partnerships, and that's how you got some more valuable cards again. And then you also created these. Um, basically these parallels. Parallels is like a, a, a weird way of saying, you know, like NFT runs, like this is a one of one, or this is a one of 10, or this is a one of a hundred. So they created all these parallels in sports, which then created uh, more scarcity. So now, you know, Luka Doncic is really famous, you know, crossover between European and American. Um, but if you get into his like highly liquid stuff, it's gone down a lot, even though he's awesome. But if you get his like one of one cards or his like one of 10 made, those are still keeping their value because people look at it as like super incredible art. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. And uh, it's, it's funny you mentioned Luka Doncic there. So like I, I played around an NBA top shot last year. Uh, Joe, I don't know if you've heard that, but it's like the big, one of the first big uh, NFT, yeah, yeah. Like sports NFT platforms. So I'm yeah, curious love, as to- Love the NBA top shot. As a matter of fact, Roham's an investor in Vincent. So the founder- Oh, of yeah, Vincent. yeah. That's cool. But like, yeah, so I'm, I always kind of wonder this and me and Joe talk about it sometimes, like we think like some altcoins kind of just like as their thesis, just sort of wedge something on the blockchain. Like we've talked about collectible cards here a lot, which are great. And, but obviously you can't print more, whatever the agencies make them and all that. And we saw that, like you said, in the eighties, but what is the advantage? Like, do you think putting these things on the blockchain, like say comparing collectibles, old fashioned Michael Jordan cards to like what we know on top shot? Like, what's the advantage there? Do you think that's a, a real industry or is that a little bit of like just trying to take advantage of the bull run and the way crypto is mooning and all that? So just to give context, I do own a Joel Embiid NBA Top Shot Legendary. So that is like, you know, one of, <laughs> I think like uh, 75, you know, from from the set, from the original set. Um, so super is that fan personal that. ownership or is that in, in a yeah, yeah, that was just my own before we, exactly. Because um, I, again, I was going after Rare. Right, because legendary was one of the most rare sets, you know. And I figured that the first set would be the iconic one because it was first. So I, you know, I got um, one of those. So with that said, I think that whether it's NFT or regular old school sports cards, everybody is trying to move into the same direction, which is how do you standardize the asset, simplify accessibility, create a good user experience, and create liquidity. So let me try to answer that with a Pele from 1958, okay? A Pele from 1958, people want to know that it's official, so it's getting standardized by third parties, by PSA, by BGS, by, you know, JSA, all these other organizations. So that's helping to verify the provenance and that it's real and what it is, right? And now you want to be able to trade it and move it as quickly as possible, so you don't want to have to deal with flights and sending physical cards or whatever. 
So what you're doing is you're getting these physical vaults, just like your bank account, right? And you could just, you know, wire somebody money. You can use Zelle, you can use PayPal, you can use Wise, whatever you want. But similarly, you can put your card into your physical vault, then digitize it just so you can see what assets you have. And if you want to then trade that asset right there, you can do it and then shift custody to another owner. Now, you did that all with a physical asset, but you did it totally digitally. Does that make sense? Yeah, makes perfect sense. Now, you fast forward, my Joel Embiid, obviously, we're doing the exact same thing, but way more software based and way more standardized, right? I don't need this third party entity to confirm this is Joel Embiid because NBA Top Shot has the actual hash and the code that says this is Joel Embiid, you know, number 13 of 75. And if it wasn't, it's a lie, right? And you can keep it right here in your account. And if you want to sell it, well, we have this liquid market. And if you want to shift it, you can go from one wallet to another. And I would say everybody wants the same thing. Uh, and I do think it's significant convergence. Um, I think in the future, you'll have, uh, you know, digital twins between physical assets, whether it's your house, your Monet, your um, Pele rookie card or Messi. Um, and they'll have potential digital NFTs right there alongside. So can I just jump in and I, I, I know one kind of to play devil's advocate one thing people say is like to continue with this pele analogy like you've got the card locked away or tent top shop make it but what if say me and joe come along and make like joe chain and create like uh the same essential nft just on a different blockchain like what how, how does that throw the spanner in the works well let's just use the pele example i mean you can create a pele rookie right now and say it's dan's pele rookie it's a one of one it's the sickest thing ever now if third parties don't verify and the demand is not there, then the demand is not there. If somehow the Dan Ashmore Pele rookie card becomes the hottest thing ever, it'll be worth you know millions and millions of dollars because it's a one of one. But you also need to have a movement of people believing that that is the real rookie card or it's the most valuable asset and you need to have all these people want it, which to tell you the truth, we're basically talking about the religion of Bitcoin right now, right? Which is Bitcoin got created. Eventually people were like, I believe in it enough. And it got enough engineering momentum, enough commercialization and all of that. So usually it doesn't work out, i.e. the graveyard of lots of layer ones and lots of other tokens. But every now and then it could work out. Look at BTC and ETH. That's a, a good analogy, actually. Um, that is a good one. Yeah. But, so who's actually buying these things? Like, are they other institutional funds? Like when you say sell a Pele for $1 million, like, is this just kind of a, a collectible not to like just big Brazil football fan? Or is this another fund such as yourself? Like, where's the liquidity coming from? They're obviously massively illiquid instruments, but like, do you know who you buy and sell from generally? No, it's totally private. Uh, it's usually done through auctions or through anonymous third parties. Usually these entities don't want to be known. Um, it's known by the organization or entity uh, helping figure out the transaction for AML KYC purposes. Um, but I would say that, you know, 10 years ago, crypto was you know, a twinkle in most people's eyes. And five years ago, you know, people that were early adopters like myself started moving forward and institutional money and venture money started moving into it to create institutional grade and to really make it more adult. I think today we're seeing the benefit of that, you know, crypto winter aside, I, I'm still very long where this is all headed. In regards to collectibles, I think we're about five, seven years behind. So I still think we're very, very early. So about 2019, I would compare, well, 2020, basically 2019, I would compare it to 2009. So like about a decade later. And I do think, not I think, you're seeing a ton of institutional money go in right now into collectible space. You have major PE firms like Blackstone buying CGC, buying into CGC. You see PSA, which was called uh, Collector's Universe, uh, was taken private from the public markets with uh, Stephen Cohen. Uh, it's now being run by Nat Turner, who sold his previous company for billions. They just raised recently on like a 4X up in the billions. You're seeing a lot of money go into this stuff. And I think four or five years from now, you're going to see a lot of people benefit. So yeah, for your listeners, I definitely think today's a good day to buy super rare, awesome assets. To be clear, it's not a good day to just buy an everyday collectible. That will go to the graveyard, just like the other <laughs> altcoin 99, nine, you know, 90% junk. So I wanna make it clear. So like, just cause you got a Jordan card does not mean it's gonna be valuable. There's a good chance it's gonna suck. And then you're gonna <laughs> complain that you just lost 80% of your money. You have to go off to, after blue chip, amazing stuff. That's where I think the majority of the value is. But I also think it's super hard because it's expensive, which is why we have this fund to simplify it for people. 
and it's hard to figure out how to get access at good prices and how to do the research to see if it's really a beautiful card or not, uh, which takes a lot of skill. This is cool. something so, I learned with all of my NFT investments from uh, this time last year. What's that? <laughs> this is what I learned. All of my NFT investments from about this time last year were definitely not blue chip at all. So they've all fallen off a cliff. But yeah, so know. like in the fund, we have exposure to like Bored Ape. And obviously Bored Apes have gone down, you know, when you combine both their floor price plus ETH price, it's gone down significantly. But, you know, I consider personally, you know, and I'm going to, uh, I, I consider more of like, board apes closer to Bitcoin. And what I mean by that is if somebody wants a gateway to crypto, they're probably starting with like BTC or ETH, right? If someone wants a gateway to uh, NFTs, I do think over time, the fractionalization and the access to, you know, board apes, et cetera, is as an example as to where they'll be headed, you know, through the blue chip stuff. Okay, so, so I, I think we're kind of running out of time here, but just quickly at the very end, um... I'm presuming that you're you're massively anti like the traditional 60 40 stock bond portfolio or whatever. Um what like for an individual investor, like just maybe for a listener listening, like what kind obviously it depends massively on your individual risk tolerance one up, but what would you advise like allocating to alternative investments in general? I think everybody has to make their own decisions. You know, it really has to do with what their personal lifestyle, their savings, what responsibilities they have. Um, of course. But I think everybody should have 5% minimum um, of their net worth. Now, that doesn't mean 5% in crypto. It doesn't mean 5% in sports cards. It means 5% into alts and yeah. diversify nicely. Um, so if you do 5% into crypto with like a 20, 20, 20, 20 split, you know, that means 1% into crypto, um, meaning 20% to alt, 5% into alts with 5, 20% splits. Um, you know, I think you could go up to 20%. I'm completely inappropriate. I'm like way over 50% of my net worth into alts. I mean, it's way 50, wow. <laughs> I'm way closer to a hundred percent, which is completely inappropriate. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I think everybody should try to get five to 10%. And obviously this is a show, but the easiest access to do that is to invest with us and we just do it for them. That's a great way to wrap up. <laughs> Any better. Yeah, 100% in alternative assets. You heard it here first. <laughs> Slava, thanks so much for your time. It's been really interesting talking to you. And uh, thanks to everyone for listening as well.